o'clock, we'll go ahead and start. We may have some other folks join us, so I'll stay on uh, for the next uh, hour or so and uh, edit up all the reports. Uh, so this meeting is the uh, FPGA meeting for Open Research Institute. We try to have it uh, every week, and what we do is we talk about what um, you know has been going on over the past week, what we have planned for the next week, if we need any resources in order to do the things that we would like to do, and if there's any roadblocks. And uh, so, go, so go ahead, Aaron, uh, you have the floor. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, so last week I was able to create the bit error rate test application um, and it reports error uh, bit errors every second. Uh, this also allowed me to enable the uh, loopback, digital loopback on the 89363. And uh, I did, not get what I was expecting, which was a bit error rate of zero. So I'm going to spend the next week uh, in the next uh, time frame um, debugging that just to try to get the MSK mod and DMOD working in loopback mode. Um, so I'm I, taking a step back from the RF loopback um, and try to diagnose um, the, the components um, to work as expected. So that's what I'll be doing. Okay, no, that sounds uh, sounds like progress to me. Uh, so the RF loop back is the outer loop, and that what you're looking at is a, a closer in loop for a bit error rate. Yeah, so it goes from the it goes from the FPGA to the eighty nine three sixty three, um, but then without leaving the transceiver, it stays within within that that digital loop uh, and comes back to the FPGA um, and to to do the uh, PRBS synchronization. Okay, yeah, very good. That's uh, that sounds familiar, and uh, we've we've certainly seen that before uh, in in various uh, designs. So, so yeah, best of luck. If there's anything that really stumps you, uh, please uh, raise the alarm on on Slack, and and we'll do our best to to kind of help. Uh, and thank you so much for the the hard work. It's uh, deeply appreciated. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right. Any anything else? Nope. That's all I had to report this week. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Uh, and you're, of course, welcome to to hang out and and stick around. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're uh, you need to 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 go off and and tackle the day, then uh, the very best wishes for for a wonderful start of the uh, relatively short week this week. Uh, so, yes. So, yeah. Kind of nice. Okay. I had a question. Um, oh sure. So I know in October, I guess it's our next milestone goal, I and mean, it's it's good to have it's great to have goals like that so that we can work towards something. And you had mentioned uh, like an end to end um, loop, right? So let's say hypothetically um, we get the MSK working as it should be, um, but that's this is just the uplink, right? Uplink to to the satellite, um, and then it gets received. And then the downlink is the work that's been done for the DBS2 encoder. Um, I guess my question is, um, is there any software on the satellite side that would convert it from opulent voice into uh, the, D, the, I guess, transport, or what's it called? Transport stream? TS stream? Oh, sure. Or, yeah. Yeah. Transport stream is is fine. Yeah. That's a That's a good... Good uh, use of the vocabulary. Yeah, the uh, there's lots that needs to be done for a true end-to-end -end test, which is our goal. That yeah. would be um, the best possible thing to to be able to demonstrate as quickly as possible. Um, and yeah, our next opportunity for demonstrating to the public is in October, um, and we we're we've reached out and we have opportunities and we're we're making the plans um, and. And, and working to try to 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 build up a volunteer base to do that. Um, so yeah, there's there is a, a, a bunch of software components that exist. The opulent voice is coming along. The uplink uh, needed attention and it's getting it and we're we're super happy with it. It can also be standalone. So you can actually have a point to point link with opulent voice. Um, but all of the work done for transceiver and opulent voice is directly applicable to the to the larger transceiver project. Um, and then once it's delivered to the to the transceiver, uh, to the payload or ground sat, um, then what we're expecting to be able to do is receive through the the polyphase channelizer uh, work mm -hmm. that uh, that Ken's working on, and then 
once you kind of pick out a channel, then mm -hmm. it's delivered to a, a state machine. And then that, that state machine kind of handles the, um, uh, you know, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to put this channel into, into uh, the frame, the DBBS2 uh, frame. Oh, okay. You know, is so, that, is that IP data at that point or is it? GSC uh, is what we're what we're trying to use. So the generic streaming okay. capulation protocol from from DB uh, from DVB. So it's DVB GSE. And so we did some early work here to kind of prove that it worked and and did some demonstrations over the air at GNU Radio Conference. That would have been right before COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. So been a while. <laughs> but yeah. but, uh, but GSE is a drop in replacement for MPEG. So when we talk about the transport stream for like DBBS2 or DBBT2, uh, the transport stream for commercial work is usually MPEG. Uh, mm -hmm. That's got a lot of overhead and it's it's essential. It's really designed. And it's an elegant design for uh, delivering video broadcasts. So what we would like to do is to have more of a generic IP, TCP IP type of experience. Um, and GSE, or generic streaming capulation, is the DVB answer for for that. And it's mm -hmm. um, it's the we think it's the right answer. So so that's the the mechanism that we're using for the transport stream, uh, for the downlink. Okay. Now there's still some work that has to be done. You have these frames, you you receiving frames on your uplink from frequency division, um, multiple access essentially. So, uh, frequency division uh, or channelized uplink, and then your polyphase channelizer is able to handle you know looking at all these different channels, and then mm -hmm. the task that that is. That at this point now, that's the least defined or least demonstrated part of the system. The channelizer itself works works very well. This is we picked up uh, Theseus Core's work mm -hmm. and implemented that, and that's that's very well done. So the channelizer part, we're highly confident everything looks very good in simulation. But then the decision making or the the multiplexing that has to happen um, at that point. That now that is the sort of the the r most ricketyest part. Um, so okay. taking all these channels and and then packing them into uh, DBS2 SOX frames for the downlink. I don't think we've demonstrated that at this point. Um, that's relatively low risk because this is you know take all the channels, put them into a stream, send it down down downwind. Um, mm -hmm. But that at that point. You know, so your question is like, what software needs to be done? That needs some yeah. attention. Oh, okay. So I guess I know from previous, I guess, weekly status, you had mentioned that there was a maybe a capability of IQ data being piped down that stream as well. So it didn't have to be opulent voice. Is that true? Yeah, so... that's, that's what we would really like to, to be able to do. So what we okay. would really like to see is, okay, if you want to use opulent voice, that's the native digital mode for this system. Mm -hmm. And the system will recognize opulent voice and we'll just pass it along, but that we would like to be able to uh, look at a channel. So if you imagine your polyphase channelizer, 96 channels or, you know, X number of channels. Yeah. And if it sees energy there, but it's not opulent voice, you know, mm -hmm. so yes, it can recognize opulent voice, but if it's not opulent voice, well, go ahead and pass it along as a channel, you know, as IQ data. And okay. that that may be, um, now you could, so then you have to ask like, okay, well, um, that would, how there's are you going to- There's a limit and bandwidth, right? On the downlink, right? There would be, mm -hmm. I don't know, we yeah. can hit that pretty easily. <laughs> yeah, we can. And it's, uh, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's lots of, there's some, there's some rubber bands in here. Um, yeah. but if you, if you don't recognize opulent voice, um, then, mm -hmm. then you can assume that that might be exper an experiment or some other modulation. Somebody is trying to use a narrow band mode in your channel and that, uh, what we would really like to do is design a system that was more elegant and could actually pass through, uh, any energy that it found. This does open you up to jamming and nefarious yeah. crap, but it's like, oh, well, you know, if all you're doing is, you know, yelling into a channel, um, and if you can figure that out, an authentication piece to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, use... there's a, there's uh, a, a, we're we're happy with the authentication, the authorization on authentication in in opulent voice, and mm -hmm. all channels could simply enforce it. 
Oh, okay. Um, you know, and we could also, we could, so, you know, the original sort of scheme was 90 channels for opulent voice and these six channels or four channels or two are experimental modes. And then mm -hmm. we did have a proposal for something called sat chat, which would take one, 10 or 20 mega, it, ten, it would, would take one channel, um, you know, depending on, on how wide it needs to be. The opulent voice needs, you know, a hundred kilohertz at least, you know, maybe more um, for the for roughly 80 kilohertz, uh, you know, lump of energy. Um, but you could take one of those channels, um, you know, hundred and some odd kilohertz, and you could divide it up into very narrow band chat modes. You know, I mean, if you yeah. looked at FT8, you can see the, the potential there. So you could then subdivide, you know, we've subdivided our 10 megahertz uh, band plan allocation okay, take one of our small channels and subdivide that and, and have essentially, you know, a large number of, of, uh, of chat modes of very efficient narrowband mm -hmm. modes. And then if, if the system recognizes that that's what's coming through, it passes through no problem, you know, so you can enforce policies for authentication and authorization because it's all mm -hmm. digital. Uh, or we could just leave one open for essentially it's going to behave somewhat like a linear transponder, but it will also get the gain from being uh, repeated. So it's yeah. not a linear transponder with a lot of loss. It's not a bent pipe. It is, we digitized this entire channel. We mm -hmm. are now presenting all of the IQ as, you know, as is, and that's an experiment. And yeah, it could be just a bunch of nonsense, but, but it could also be uh, a channel open for, for experimentation and, and it would be, be properly, it'd be, you know, sampled and, and repeated in a multi regenerative multiplexing type of repeater system. So all of those things are open to us with the current architecture. That's just a, a question of programming and, yeah. uh, and paying attention. So for the first end to end test, then if it's all opulent voice and that's it, <laughs> And, yeah. you know, and if you don't show up with the right authentication and authorization in the protocol, then I'm sorry, you're just simply not going to get through. Uh, yeah. That's the first demo. And then yeah. uh, showing that it can be opened up and, and you can have channels uh, that allow for experimentation in other modes, like subdividing for sat chat or whatever, um, then that would follow a successful end-to-end mm -hmm. -end demo. So I know, so it's the downlink is DVBS2. Um, is there a particular uh, modulation that work that is already planned um, based on like um, what do you call it <clears throat> link budget and stuff? It, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yeah. The there there are a number of link budgets. Probably the best one we have is, are are a set from Jan King, who's done a whole lot of work here commercially and for the amateur service. So mm -hmm. looking at the link budgets for for the ten gigahertz downlink and looking at the bandwidth that we have. Uh, we use adaptive coding and modulation. So depending on the station and depending on, you know, the, on the conditions, because uh, 10 gigahertz can swing quite a bit from atmospheric, mm -hmm. uh, you know, brain fade or, or whatever, um, then it just looks at SNR and assigns the modulation and coding. And we expect to use uh, the ones on what would be the lower end. So mm -hmm. we, we're looking at lower... Yeah. Yeah, like, QPSK. yes, yeah. I'd say QPSK is probably <clears throat> going to be a workhorse um, mm -hmm. up to 8 PSK maybe. Um, you know, but we we have in the, like in the, the code, it's it's all of them, you know. So if you yeah. have a yeah, I know. I have booming that, yeah. signal, like, and you, <laughs> there is a limit, like even under perfect conditions, if you only have 10 megahertz to work with and you have subdivided it down to channels, even if you channel bond, like on the uplink, somebody decides if we do channel bonding, like we say, okay, mm -hmm. if you want one channel, fine, that, that's really high quality voice, you can, and, and we can interleave, uh, you know, data and text, uh, no problem with opulent voice. But let's say you really want a, a broader band connection and you want to grab like 10 of these channels, you know, so, yeah. so the, e even with that, um, we're still not up in the high throughput satellite category of DVB S2 or S2X. Okay, but all of that's available because maybe someday we want to take the system and we want to go to a higher frequency where we have a much broader bandwidth or we just set aside the 
10 gigahertz band plan and we say, well, we think 40, 40 megahertz would work or more. So hmm. there's, there's a lot of flexibility if you do it right and you just build in the entire ModCod ecosystem into your code. So that's what we've done so far. And we don't expect with the way that we have it set up with the you know 10 megahertz uh, allocation for satellite in five and 10 gig, we don't expect that it will get up to the higher order modulation or or yeah. or complicated uh, codex, but they're there. Yeah. So yeah. we we do expect that it'll hover around the the lower uh, blob, you know, on that chart. So it's not a single it's not a single downlink then. It's it could be multiple it downlinks. It's oh, a it same, is a single downlink. It is it, it yeah. is a single downlink. So it is a single set of frames coming at you, but each frame can have a different modulation encoding. And this is where the state machine yeah. or the queuing or the quality of service decisions come in. Mm -hmm. And this is the tricky part that we know in theory. And we've been able to simulate, uh, but is has yet to be uh, coded and demonstrated over the air. When you have a diverse mix of stations transmitting up, and they each get assigned a channel, they each successfully prove that they can hear themselves in the downlink, that they can at least get into the communications resource, that they're there, that they've passed authentication authorization, you know, and you've got a channel. Um, each one of them is going to have a different SNR sort of experience. Right. So some people are going to have a really nice dish and it will be pointed directly at the either ground sat or spacecraft. And some are not going to have the best pointing or yeah. they are going to have a teenier dish or whatever. You know, we, we don't even know. Somebody might have a very fancy phase array system that really booms in and someone might try to get in with a Omni, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> which would be yeah. wild. But, you know, you never know what you might find. And that's yeah. kind of the the power of this sort of thing. And that's why adaptive coding modulation makes makes sense because it adapts to whatever ground equipment mm -hmm. people have and you, you're all aiming at the same resource. So each frame gets packed with, the, you know, each, so a frame of DVV S2 is a particular mod cod. And your job as a packer, you know, at the factory of packets is to, pick the ones like, oh, okay, I've got enough for QBSK at three-fourths, you know, code rate. And, and you, mm -hmm. you, as soon as you get it, you send it out and off it goes, you know, and then, so your job is to, is to keep the stream going. The physical layer header of the DBBS2 packet contains all the information about what mod cod the, the payload has. Yeah. And yeah, it can get kind of crazy. So we can't wait to see uh, what breaks and, yep. you know, yeah. what what <laughs> flow control we have to do or or if we have to drop back to a, okay, so like the original paper about this choice for adaptive coding and modulation restricted the choices. Uh, what mm -hmm. we did is we said, okay, we'll pick out four or five mod cods and you can only choose, you know, you, you so it's a sort of a hysteresis curve. You, you have to really be good enough to get into this mod cod that we mm -hmm. are offering uh, in order yeah. to reduce the number of, of distinct packet types that are in the downlink. Because time mm -hmm. is of the essence, especially with voice. Like a voice packet that needs to go out at a certain time or, you know, it's it's gone. Data is different and text chat is different. Those can tolerate some latency, but your voice really can't, you know. Yeah. Um, so if it's voice communications, which we sort of expect it will be, then limiting the number of mod cods from the full, very large yeah. adaptive encoding modulation ecosystem, limiting to the like four or five really makes a huge difference. And then it's, yeah, everything can go out. You have your latency curve and you have your variety curve of, of, of mod cods. And when they cross, that's your sweet spot that you're giving people the maximum amount of flexibility and you're getting the most out of their station, but you're also delivering the best possible bit rate through the, the aggregate bit rate through the whole thing. And so that's yeah. kind of what we assume we might need. Um, that's assuming that there's actually a load on the system, that there's enough yeah. people using it, um, which we hope there will be, but you know, that's yeah. some of the design decisions that we've had to make, a lot, make along the way. Would it always be transmitting something or would it, there would be points yes. of blank? Okay. Yes. 
Yeah, DVB S2 is designed to always be transmitting something. So if there's nothing to transmit, then it transmits what's called a dummy frame. And that just okay. keeps the synchronization, keeps everything working. Um, opulent voice is a little bit different. So opulent voice will keep transmitting until it really, really, really runs out. And then it mm -hmm. counts for a little bit longer and then we'll shut down. Because the cost of restarting opulent voice is really low. But the cost mm -hmm. of restarting something like DVBS2 is kind of high. So the yeah. system's just designed to always be on. And, you know, it, it went in with, there's nothing else to transmit, then it transmits a, a designated dummy frame. Okay. That way all your pilots and all your, you know, yeah. sync, sync words and everything, they're always there. And you just have to find the, and also it helps like on, on for terrestrial deployments, this is not that big of a deal, but mm -hmm. for space, it kind of is, especially if you, if we end up uh, on a, which is all highly likely we'd end up on a, a payload that's moving around. And so if, okay. if it stops transmitting, well, you're hosed, you don't know where it is. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it always has to be transmitting and that, that will help you find it and mm -hmm. uh, and then track it so that's just and that's kind of like it's inherent in the dvbs2 protocol okay yeah dummy frames are pretty cool and if, originally um i thought we would be able to kind of leverage the dummy frames for extra purposes but they're unmodulated it's this is a oh, okay yeah so there's no i was like drat you know? yeah <laughs> Yeah. I thought, yeah, no, you actually do have to like pack a frame and, and like ma do all the, like there's, there was no shortcut, yeah. you know, I was like, drat. So, but yeah, they're, they will be there all the time and it makes it, it makes it pretty easy to, to find, and we're, our, our baseline is to include all of the extra stuff. Well, it's not extra, but it's optional. So you can, you can get back a little bit of the throughput. You can recover some of the bits. Um, mm -hmm. by turning off the pilots and by not using all of the synchronization yeah. goodies. But we're like, we're new. You know, I think we that, <laughs> yeah. no, we're going to, we, we're just going to include all of that and say, no, we use pilots. We use all the syncs. We use all of that. And okay. because we anticipate that, especially if somebody is building a station or, you know, or using equipment that that might have been intended for another purpose. Like they're going to need yeah. all the help that they can get. And besides, the link really isn't that booming to begin with. You know, so mm -hmm. we we have a for amateur from an amateur's perspective, ten megahertz sounds big. It sounds like a broadband. Yeah. Thing. But from a space, you know, or commercial perspective, that that is more narrow band than. Yeah. Then maybe some. So we really do want the signal to be very easy to to find, and so we are going to turn on everything and all the bells and whistles. Now this does take a little bit away from the from the bit rate, you know, the data throughput, yeah. but not that much. It's 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 going to be okay. So it's it's yeah. it's a price worth paying. What about the receiver? Like, what where is the status on that, or what are, or the thoughts on what the receiver is going to look like? Is that just based yeah, the, on the main burden of the receiver is the software to write for that. The mm -hmm. um DVBS2 and S2X receivers are have been around for many years and there's yeah. a lot of options there. So you can receive a signal. It's a standard DVBS2 S2X signal. Mm -hmm. You'll receive it. GSE is less popular commercially than MPEG, okay. which is true but yeah. a gse we did a gse receiver uh it's been done and it's been in good radio for for years now and there's a wireshark um uh protocol doohickey that mm -hmm. one of our volunteers did so you have the tools so we have okay. the tools we got the ability to receive a a dvbs2 signal that's been there's lots of options now both okay. there's commercial cards you know that people get for Windows, for Linux, probably even for Mac, and and there's the, all the tools have GSE protocol in it. Uh, a nice user experience, a nice user interface. What we would like to see uh, for a ground station, not really, not really there. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you can get audio out, 
with GSE, or you get oh, not really audio, you get IP out, and then you can yeah. use all of the standard necessary calls, like all of the standard pro programs that you would expect to to be able to use uh, VLC or whatever. You should be mm -hmm. able to use to if it's opulent voice going up, all of that's gonna gonna be uh, everything for that we're developing for opulent voice. You'll be able to use um, above the IP TCP/IP layer, so TCP/IP, mm -hmm. uh, RDP, all of that included. You'll be able to 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 pick off the signal and and get all of that data back out without having some sort of weird custom software that. That we make you install, um, yeah. but we need to provide a, a solution that is as flexible and it gets out of your way as quickly as possible. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the goal. It's working so far. Um, that may actually be the last part <laughs> that gets yeah. done because so much of it is already done. So we, our mm -hmm. decision was to leverage existing protocols like that and to mm -hmm. to make that in the like in in opulent voice so that you could use if you prefer VLC or if you want to write your own or if you have some sort of Python thing. Um, and initially, I think a couple, as of at least a couple of years ago, and I'm still partial to this solution, it was use HTML5. Like mm -hmm. you just need a browser and a computer attached to your radio, you know, and it can be yeah. an SDR that you downloaded the firmware from either GNU radio or whatever. And that the signal just goes all the way through and that you can interact with it in a browser, no problem. And that's that we're, that's still a big contender. But mm -hmm. just in the past couple of years, we've seen a substantial improvement in other options for for user interfaces. And it's a very exciting time to kind of look at like how do you really how do you do a remote radio? You, you yeah. know, or so you don't have to be sitting at hardware that we have sold you. Yeah. You can, you need a radio that's capable of doing these functions. Here's our board, you know, here's, yeah. here's an option or here's a build on, you know, maybe a Pluto can pull it off uh, yeah. or whatever. And so we're trying to figure out the p best path forward that involves like the least amount of annoyance to, to an operator yeah. and that uses these bands as fully and completely as, as possible. So that's that's kind of the goal, you know, so I'm kind of partial to like, oh, it's all in the browser or it's a web app. That would be mm -hmm. really cool and would be very flexible. Um, you know, and if you wanted if you wanted to own hardware that did it all, sure. You know, we, we, we aim to do that. Um, yeah. That might be an expensive solution. Like that's gonna be hundreds of dollars to buy that radio, really realistically mm -hmm. um but that's pretty much the only way to demo it to get uh, somebody else larger than us to be interested is to actually build it and show it and demo it mm -hmm. so so that's that's in the books that's funded that's that's as soon as we can find both halves of our derriere with our hands then we can <laughs> yeah, go ahead and show that yeah hey paul Hello. Hi there. Oh, welcome. Um, yeah, we're just talking about the the overall plan for the transceiver. Uh, so Aaron had some some really good questions. Uh, it was a, a pleasure to be able to answer them. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, some some <laughs> questions I have no idea. But you know, these are all ones I'm so enthusiastic about. I I love yeah. the project, and I think we're we get closer every week, and I'm I'm just I'm super happy and. I owe everybody uh, I, just just a huge uh, thank you for all of the the really amazing work. Um, yeah, every week is 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 fabulous. So, yeah, Paul, catch us up on um, on Remote Lab. I, I know you you uh, have not been there the past, <laughs> past week, I've, but I've been remote from the Remote Labs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, you did have some some experiments and some new hardware that I think I think it got installed. So. So yeah, take take it away. Yeah, hopefully I'm awake enough to actually string a few sentences together about that. Um, barely missed sleeping through the meeting entirely. Um, before we left on our trip, which was a week ago, uh, we did get the new SSD uh, carrier installed. So there's a 
a new PCI board plugged into the last PCI slot on Chonk, the Unraid server that serves all the virtual machines on the remote lab. And that board has room for four uh, NVMe SSDs. And we bought four, four terabyte SSDs, high speed brand name SSDs, uh, and filled it up. And that is now in the uh, in the server. And the, the four SSDs show up as available in the Unraid UI, which is good. That took some fiddling around. Uh, there's a BIOS setting that had to be turned on in order to split the, the PCI slot from one 16-lane slot to four four-lane slots, which is what the SSDs need for maximum performance. Um, from there, I thought it would all be clear sailing. Uh, I had a, a little bit of time before we departed, and I played with it briefly and found out that it's surprisingly not as simple as I thought. And um, <laughs> something is is getting in the way of just instantiating one of those disks into one of the virtual machines or either the other option being unifying all those disks into one big RAID array. And I encountered stumbling blocks on both paths and uh, then I threw up my hands and had to pack and go. So that's where we are right now. I don't know what's wrong. I just know that it's not ready to go yet. Uh, and it means that the remote lab has been offline while we were gone, unfortunately, and uh, wasn't able to bring it back up into a sensible uh, configuration without risking all the VMs. So I was working on Nuts, which is one of the least used VMs. <clears throat> it would be easiest to reconstruct from scratch if necessary. And it came up unbootable. We don't want that to happen to the other VMs. So that's that's where we stand. And uh, next time I'm awake and ambitious and feel like risking my life on the uh, risk, at least risking the lives of the VMs, uh, I will dig into it again. Okay, then um, what I'll what I'll do uh, with everybody that's that's working on on protocol stuff is we'll keep working on paper and doing code reviews and simulations and until we can move back into the back into the lab. Um, and I'm I'll be around so I can I can help if a extra set of set of hands or eyeballs can can uh, can be of, of worth. <laughs> but thank you very Not much for well. diving in and helping. Um, you know, for those listening, the the goal of the extra hardware or additional hardware, not really extra, um, is to address some performance issues with the uh, with the lab, and also to uh, and, and performance issues in terms of speed and also space. Uh, so it turns out that the things that we do, which we we knew this, uh, but the things that we do take up lots and lots of uh, disk space, uh, especially when it comes to to Vivado, uh, and and other tools. They are um, they like to spread around, and we, since we do uh, R and D, uh, we do have to to handle um, a lot of different versions of, say, Vivado and Pata Linux as well, um, and also Vitus and all of the stuff that comes with it, um, and some of the other. And it's not the only uh, tool chain that we use, so we're we try to support other tool chains, including. We have several installations of MATLAB because we we need to move around to different versions of MATLAB because of some compatibility with the transceiver toolbox and this is it can get kind of complicated. Um, the other experiments that we run on remote labs, like if people are doing like Python or um, uh, you know build root versions, those do take up space as well. Like the different build root, it's a build root based for thing for the Pluto builds. Um, that adds to it. So, you know, expanding the the net amount of disk space is a real big deal uh, that will make it a lot nicer experience for people. They don't have to, to be uh, as on top of the disk space usage as we have had to be lately. And also speeding it up would be good. By all rights, it should be very, very fast. But compared to, to other machines, we're not getting the performance that we expect. We're not really sure why, but the this is a 
uh, we have a good theory here with the additional uh, drives. Did I miss anything, Paul? No, I, no, no, that covers it. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you so much for spearheading this. It's a sort of a third rail job. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay. One, so, one, oh, go ahead. One thing that crossed my mind that we hadn't talked about yet is that if I had the hardware that's currently marooned in Little Rock to experiment with, I could do tests that would not be disruptive to to people who are trying to use the lab. So I could have to have a prototype system offline to do non-prod uh, tests on that. I know that's a little bit hard to accomplish and maybe not, not certainly not zero cost, but that would be a possibility. Yeah, no, we, um, let's talk about that and figure out what we can do. Um, I've worked very hard on trying to get like IEEE and some, some local uh, groups um, in Little Rock to to get interested in the remote lab. And so far I've generated a flurry of introductions and lots of talk, uh, but no commitments. And that's kind of a, a flag, I think. Um, so we'll, we'll have to consolidate. <laughs> Consolidation may be the right answer. You know, uh, I think we've, we've hit this pretty hard and, and tried multiple attempts to try to get a lab in, um, in Florida and then in Arkansas. Um, so I'll I'll probably I'll make one more push and then go get the equipment. So I think probably flying out there um, and doing some work related visits in the region uh, and maybe driving everything back might be the right answer. So that's my thoughts. All right, now we have a, a large amount of regulatory things to talk about because uh, we're writing a comment. Uh, for an MPRM on the 900 megahertz band. I'm going to go ahead and push that off to uh, to another meeting because we're we're already over mm -hmm. about a half hour. Um, and uh, and Ed and, and and Matthew and the other folks uh, aren't able to be here. Uh, but it's, do either of you have a have input or questions about the regulatory work that we're that we're tackling? No, I, I don't. I, I have received and looked at the documents, but I have not yet absorbed them, so I'm not in a position to make any comments. Okay, we have a couple of days. Uh, the well, a day really. Uh, the the so our the first round of comments are due on the fifth. I think that we're on track to be able to 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 upload our. You know, we'll prepare essentially a PDF and we'll upload it. Uh, to the FCC. So we will be able to file our comment before the deadline. There will be another round of replies to comments that will open up pretty much immediately. And I think the deadline for that is the 15th of September. So we will participate through the entire process and, um, you know, uh, the crew that's working on it will do our best to, you know, include ORI folks, anybody that wants to to look over what we've got. Uh, I sent out the draft introduction to our comment this morning, so it went out on Slack and also on the uh, on the email list, um, and it's coming together. So there will be some some work today, and uh, and work tomorrow, and some review and some some uh, you know to try to make sure that it says exactly what it we want it to say, and is an effective comment, uh, and then we'll we'll. We'll read uh, all the other comments. There will be a lot that will be filed in the next couple of days, right before the deadline. That's that's pretty typical. And then if there's anything that needs rebuttal, then we will participate in in that that as well. Because uh, 900 megahertz is a good band for for us. Uh, this is something that we would really like to see. We maintain the sort of access that we have right now. Um, the proposal from NextNav to use it for PNT. And to essentially uh, invite in 5G broadband data to this band will um, it'll kind of mess things up for for us. Uh, amateur radio is a fairly low priority uh, user of the band, but it's it's important to have bands like this uh, for for us. Um, and there's another at least one large uh, innovative fun amateur radio 
project that, that uses it, and that's Meshtastic. And that uses LoRa as the main technology. And the concern there is that essentially anything with high power would um, would wipe out or push off LoRa. The other concern that we've talked about is that anything with PNT, if it's being pitched as a backup to GPS and of great you know, national security importance or economic importance, that pretty much interference with that is totally verboten. And this will drive out um, pretty much any other use of the band. So that's the the concerns that, that some folks have. And we'll be We'll be addressing those concerns along with the what we consider to be some technical deficiencies in the next app's proposal. So that's the highlights of that. Uh, so we'll have a definitely have a working meeting on this uh, this week, uh, and then file comments on the fifth before close of business East Coast. All right. Any other comments or questions before we close? I have a breaking news bulletin on Remote Lab. Uh, <laughs> The, wow! Uh, breaking news. Breaking news. Okay. <laughs> um, we had some power glitches here last night uh, as we were all going to sleep, and uh, it did not disrupt the server in the remote lab. Apparently, it's still up, but the uh, the Raspberry Pi that runs remote access it rebooted itself successfully and came back, which is good. Uh, but it means we were on the edge of having glitches, so anything in the remote lab might need rebooting from now on. Um, and this may add complication to the state that the, the server was in, because I was trying to leave it up and running in the state I had left it, and apparently that may have succeeded. <laughs> so, All right. <laughs> Wow, interesting. All right. Very good. Another way we could spend money if we wanted to is adding um, an in uninterruptible power supply to the remote lab system. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, that's fun to have breaking news from the lab. And uh, I'll see you all on Slack. And uh, let me know if you need anything over the next week. So we should be meeting again this time next week. Um, and uh, happy to be back uh, in San Diego from from Washington, D.C. It was um, it was very warm there and humid and interesting. Uh, the FCC TAC meeting went really well. Uh, so there'll be lots of things to to process and, and to write about that. Uh, the next TAC meeting will be in late December. Uh, so I expect that the weather in D.C. will be quite different from what was experienced this past week, uh, late December. It should be genuine winter weather in DC. So looking forward to that. All right, talk to you guys soon. Yep, thank you. You bet. Bye-bye.